Welcome to Pop Culture Week 5. We're talking about what it means to look at and understand things in general and comics in particular. I hope you enjoy. So I want to think about what it means to see because there's this idea um, that people may have heard, which is seeing is believing, right? But a lot of people in cultural studies flip that and they say believing is seeing. And what they mean is the assumption that if I see something, I'll know it exists, is how most people think about the world, right? It's totally fine if that makes perfect sense to you, right? But think about the other flip side of that, which is if I believe in something, I'll see it. And this happens all the time, especially if you look, you know, back way, way earlier in time. If people believe that Zeus was angry, they would see a thunderstorm and they would be, that would confirm, they would see Zeus being angry, right? Today we can say like, well, actually static electricity and all the other scientific things that I don't understand is causing the thunderstorm. And, you know, we see that because we're thinking perhaps about um, electricity and these other factors of weather, right? But if you were an ancient Greek citizen and you understood that uh, Zeus controlled the weather and he had this famous lightning bolt and he would get angry or his wife would cry and that was the rain and stuff, that would confirm it, right? And you could say to people at the time, look, it's raining, so clearly Hera is sad. Or it's really loud thunder, Zeus has been angered, let's go sacrifice a bull, and that would be proof to you. So. It sounds strange now, but think about all the things that you see today that I'm sure, myself included, um, in a hundred years, especially in a thousand years, people will look back and say, I can't believe they thought that that was the case. I mean, these people, what were they thinking? And that's exactly it. They were thinking, and then so they saw what they had learned to see, not the reverse. They didn't see things and then learn what they were. They learned things and then saw what they had learned. And Again, that seems a little confusing, but that's one of the reasons I think studying comics is such an important thing to do, because it'll help us understand how to see and how it is that we see culturally. So take this for example. So this is uh, an image from Scott McCloud's great, great book. I encourage you to read the whole thing if you get a chance, Understanding Comics. But think about how much time passes in these two sets of images, right? On the top, you have a guy tipping his hat. But you don't actually have a guy tipping his hat. What you have is a picture of a guy with a hat and then a picture of a guy with a hat slightly elevated. But you understand, probably, I hope, I mean, this is Comics 101, right? That between those two things, the idea is that he went like this. And, you know, movies do this, what you're watching does this by having thousands or millions of, of images rapidly in succession. But this just has two. And so we just read between the lines and we say, okay, well, he must have done that. And so that took a few seconds, maybe. And then look at the other one, right? We see a sunset. Although we don't actually see a sunset, we see a circle and a horizontal line. And then we see another circle, or most of a circle, and then hor another horizontal line. And this time they're touching. And so what we can imagine is that the sun has set. And so that's been a few hours, perhaps. But we don't know that, we just read into that because that is a common way to represent things like tipping a hat or a sunset. We often have a happy face, right? We can do it now where we can use a colon or a semicolon and a um, closing bracket or closing parentheses. And a lot of us will understand like, okay, he's doing a, a really basic emoticon. He's doing a happy face or a winking face or something, right? We understand that because we've learned to see those things. But if you showed a different culture at a different time, two dots, and then the end of a parenthesis, they would have no idea what you're talking about. And similarly, if you showed them this, I mean, imagine, again, this alien who comes down and somehow speaks English but doesn't understand the world. First of all, you have to explain that this circle and this line and stuff, that represents a person, which sounds crazy to, I mean, just imagine hearing that for the first time, right? So, and then this is a top hat, uh, which is actually just a uh, rectangle, but then the rectangle gets lifted because we imagine that there's gravity and the hand is pushing it up and that he is doing that to greet somebody. So clearly somebody is on the other side of this whom he has said hello to. 
And so there's all this cultural meaning, right, in this, these really basic images. And that's one of the really interesting things about visual representation. So there's so much we could talk about. The transition or the, the difference in meaning going from a very abstract face, and McLeod talks about this, right? We have these famous characters that we can all kind of see ourselves in because they're so basic, the structure of them, right? A lot of the time, we, all see, we can all see ourselves in a happy face. It can represent any of us because it doesn't seem to have the cultural baggage, right? It doesn't have, uh, most of the time, it doesn't have a race, it doesn't have a gender, it doesn't have um, any distinguishing features. It's just a circle and then a little line, right, that indicates a smile. And so we can see ourselves in that. Whereas if I show you a picture of myself, you're thinking that's Chris, that's not me. And so maybe you can identify a little bit like, oh yeah, I, I have the same like of uh, certain things as Chris, so we can identify in this way. But you're definitely not 100% sort of being like, yeah, that's me there, because it's already someone very specific. So that's another way in which images can speak to us. And you'll realize that Disney, for example, one of the reasons that they are popular are they usually do cartoons and that they do these very basic line drawings is because then hopefully anyone who sees them can see themselves in that character and, and feel what the character is feeling. It's a little bit harder when it's someone specific. And you'll know this because if you, if you ever see a film or a TV show and it's a new actor, somebody who you haven't seen before, it's usually a lot easier to be like, oh, okay, this is this character. Whereas if it's somebody who, let's say, outside in, in Hollywood has been known to be doing these horrible things or to have just had an affair or to have just, you know, run over somebody in his car and is in the middle of a lawsuit, it's very hard to be like, oh yeah, this is that character in this show that I'm watching because you know all that background, right? And that's another thing we can talk about, the intertextuality of things, right? Where you see one image, but that image reminds you or is associated with other images and that's important. There's a lot of other things that are important. For example, how would you draw something? Today, you would probably learn to draw something in a very um, sort of cookie cutter way, but that's not the only way. And you can see that that's different because you can look at different civilizations and different time periods, and they have very different ways of representing things. We also have the history of technology. And so when you think about the first image, the first photograph, I mean, there's debate about what the first photograph is, but we could say once we started to capture images like this, then we started to change the way that we see things. For example, you're, you're looking at this video and it's two dimensional, right? I'm not recording this in VR, but you, you understand that, you know, I'm in front of my bookshelf and that I'm a 3D person, hopefully, right? Although I, get, I could be a deep fake, but that's a whole other story. We, you can take AI with me next time. But um, you, know, you understand that this is that I'm three-dimensional, but you're not seeing me three-dimensional, you're seeing me two-dimensionally. It's strange, but we, we just so quickly associate two dimensions with three dimensions now that it's natural, or it seems natural, but that's the whole point, right? Images and the way we see images are never natural. We're trained to see them in certain ways. And so images can manipulate people. That's a very clear thing that I hope that you've understood by now. Um, Growing up, I'm sure you've seen a lot of commercials, you've seen a lot of films. You can think about the ways that images speak so clearly. You know, how do you show someone being heroic? For example, you show them from below, from a low angle. And so that makes them look bigger, right? And that unconsciously makes you feel more like a child. And so if you think of, you know, your father or someone when you were three, he looked huge, he was, you know, he could lift anything and he could do all these things that you couldn't do. And so just having a low angle makes you feel a little bit like that, right? Another reason why the Greek gods, for example, um, were always so huge in the sculptures that people made of them to show not only that they were important, but also that they were you know, big and powerful and, and by comparison, we were weak and small. Um, that's one way to do it, right? There's other ways to manipulate people. This famous uh, Rockwell painting, I love, it's, um, I mean, it's such a crazy thing to think about what desegregation would have been like at this time. But notice a few things here, right? Notice that you're on eye level with the girl and not with the men. That makes a huge difference in how you see this image. It also makes you 
empath empathize with her. Whereas if, I mean, think about if you wanted to show a racist image, you could easily do it where you are identifying with a different group and you are understanding this other group as bad and there are lots of ways. I mean, just watching German propaganda during World War II, the, the way that they make people animals is such a, such a powerful tool to dehumanize people and to justify inhuman things, right? But the opposite is also true. When you see the suffering of somebody on an eye-to-eye -eye level, it's very hard not to associate yourself with them. Whereas if you see something from a distance, you automatically feel a little bit more distance emotionally from them. Uh, so close-ups are much more powerful in films than if you have long shots, right? And you, I mean, I encourage you to take cinema if you're not, because there's so many things that we could talk about. But all I want to do today is talk about a few things and ask you a few questions that you can fill out online about how we see things and how they're represented. And you'll learn that in understanding the way the world looks and the way the world is represented. So that's another actual difference, right? Is the way the world looks and the way the world is represented are two different things. But we often are trained to see the way the world really looks through the way it's represented, right? So if you see people represented as powerful all the time through propaganda, through commercials or whatever, then if you were to see that person in real life, they would look powerful to you. And that's another example of how um, believing is seeing, seeing is not believing. Or you can just, you can flip the common idea on its head because then you'll understand the power of images. So there are a lot of techniques that we can use. We can see how different influences, right? Japanese influence in terms of drawing and aesthetic versus North American versus European versus, um, yeah, ancient China, ancient uh, Egypt, all of these are places that had their own sort of aesthetic and that today we, you know, current authors or, or artists have taken ins inspiration from a lot of these places. But there are so many ways to read a comic. One important thing to think about is that you are indeed reading a comic. I think some traditionalists might say that you can only read words, uh, so literature is the only way that you can read, but it, it's actually a really valuable skill to be able to read images because there's so much that images are saying that you're getting, but often you're getting it on an unconscious level. When you get it on a conscious level, it's first of all much harder to manipulate you. And secondly, it's much easier to critique and to analyze because you can say, well, the low angle makes this person look heroic, but they're not because here's what we have to consider. Whereas if you didn't have that vocabulary, you didn't have that understanding, you could just point to a picture and be like, this guy's a hero, what are you talking about? And you'll notice this, right? Parents, friends, family, some people, especially if they haven't taken any kind of liberal arts, um, pop culture style class, they might be more apt to say like, well, this is the truth, look at, look at it. But now hopefully you know a little bit more about how it's not necessarily the truth, it's just the way that it's represented and that's different than the truth. But you learn to see the truth through the way things are represented, at least until it becomes a conscious issue that you think about and analyze. So hopefully you can enjoy the comic next week, the Willingham comic fables. I want you to read all um, of the first section. So it's called um, Fables in Exile or Legends in Exile. But it's um, a story arc that's about a murder and you'll see a lot of the techniques that we're talking about and that Scott McCloud talks about. And I think it's kind of, there's so much that we could talk about that's fascinating about how it's represented and what happens and, and the choices that are made in terms of narrative, in terms of aesthetic, in terms of um, showing and not telling, which is another really important thing. Really great comics often show you things, but you don't even realize that you've been shown it um, because they didn't explicitly tell it to you. So it's another way in which you can improve your ability to understand and unpack, clarify the implicit meanings and values. So we'll talk about that. I also encourage you to draw a little bit and you'll see in the activities, but you don't need to draw well. I don't draw well and I really respect people that do, but when you try to draw something, you realize how it is in your mind and how you think about things and you'll realize the decisions that have to be made, right? Because you might look at something and say, well, that's just a guy with a sword. And that may be true, but if the guy with the sword looks huge and is full of muscle and is coming from a certain angle and the lighting is different, that's going to give you an effect that's very different than if 
the image seems to be coming from a high angle and he looks weak by the way that the color is or something like that, right? That's, you know, a common way from Disney to comics to modern uh, live action films that people make you like and dislike certain people. And that propaganda can make you like and dislike certain people, right? If you go back to um, some of the, the early German films during the World War, the Germans were all muscular and they were filmed from below. And again, we go back to this sort of heroic thing and the bad people were filmed from a distance so that you don't associate with them and as small and as bad and as sinister and the shadows were deep. And so anyway, the more that you can learn to see and the more that you can question how you've learned to see, the more you'll be able to unpack the world because more and more things are visual and visual only because when somebody says something, they can be critiqued because people understand that the words that you use are your choice and that you are um, biased. We're all biased. People less often understand that the images we choose are also your choice and that they can be critiqued, even if they're photorealistic images, right? So even if someone takes a photograph, from what angle are they taking it? How are they taking it? What's the lighting? How have they developed it? How have they exposed it, right? There are, there's no such thing as an unbiased image. That's not to say all images are bad, but they're always telling you much more than you realize. But as you develop skills to unpack these images, you'll develop skills to unpack the, the implicit meanings in them as well, which I think could not be more important in today's society. So enjoy, have some fun with it. I encourage you to read the comic, even though that's what we'll be discussing next week. But um, the more that you can look at it and, and think about the images, the more that you'll get out of the whole experience. And that's also your second assignment is a critique of the comic. But we'll talk much more about that later. In the meantime, enjoy yourselves. I mean, think about this. This is your homework. You're reading comics and you're, you're looking at stuff and maybe you're drawing a few things. Like, life could be much worse. But it's important and it will be helpful for you in your future. So it's not all just fun and games, but it's also, I mean, I know I would much be, rather be doing this than uh, math homework or something, but nothing, nothing against math. Enjoy your week.